There's English and Spanish interpreter. Oh. Oh, a minute. She's just starting the recording. Yeah, at the moment, leave it like that so you can hear me. Oh. And then, in a, yeah, in a few no, minutes I'm, when we start, I'm, you can click over to... Sorry? To what? Can I click on the English now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Cool. Right. One minute, I've got something on my screen now. I need to click. This is just, just um, a message saying that we're gonna record it. You understand that? Yep. It's like a permission right. thing. Right. Yeah, all connected, all good? Yes. Live and direct from Naga Una Valencia, where in the past we've had the fortune of Renable Neil being here in person quite a few times, I think, in Valencia. And before that, I had the privilege of meeting Neil, as you know, in Ossaling, where you'd come and give uh, summer courses and also, yeah, touring around Spain. We'd follow you around, listen to your teachings since yeah, a long time ago, I think maybe 1998 or 99, the first time I met you. So what can I say about Brenda Neil Houston, other than that he's a living example of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's teachings. And from, yeah, from my point of view, I think he's one of the, the jewels in the Western Sangha crown, so to speak. And why do I say that? That's enough. Because that, um, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. That, that's enough, Steve. Just a few little that's things. That's enough introduction. Because he's so humble. Finish. Already he's given a perfect example of how humble he is. He doesn't want me to continue talking about his qualities. <laughs> and I remember one story you said, in one of the earlier courses with you, how you actually became a monk. And um, yeah, apparently it was, as you, you told the story, it was sort of by mistake. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's just so humble. And then, yeah, through the, over the years, I've had the privilege of attending Lama Zopa Rinpoche's yeah, big events in the, in the centers in, in Europe, when in the good old days, when Rinpoche would come and give yeah, a month long retreat. And uh, all the Western Sangha, more, than, more often than not, Rinpoche would choose Venerable Neil to lead discussion groups or lead the chanting or um, yeah, review sessions. So I think that kind of shows, you know, basically Venerable Neil Houston, we're not just talking Western Sangha. In my point, of, from my point of view, he's, he's a Lama who just happens to be Western. And um, basically, I'd like to be more like him. So it's an honor for Neil to be here, not in person, but we're still going to be able to listen to his teachings and his amazing examples and hopefully get inspired to put these teachings into practice, which I think, from my point of view, Venerable Neil is the embodiment of someone who's not just studying and you know listening to teachings, but putting them into practice in his life. So I won't embarrass you anymore, just to say it's a real honor, real privilege to, to be able to put this course on and to be able to share your teachings with, with so many people in Spain. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thanks everyone. Um, yes, so, um, yes, I, I, I don't know what I can say after that incredible <laughs> over the top introduction. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so it's really nice to see some of the people here I, that I recognize. That's great. Hello to everyone. Uh, I really wish I could be uh, in Spain. I really I genuinely uh, enjoyed being in Spain so much and the people there. I really feel I do have a really good connection with Spain and the people of Spain. Maybe that's kind of arrogant to say, think that, but I, I do. Anyway, um, Yes. So um, uh, after that incredible introduction, this this couple of talks is kind of extremely disappointing, and probably you've all heard it before. Um, so even though we've all studied this subject before, probably maybe there's some people here I don't know who may may have not um, are not familiar with the eight verses of mind training. Um, but even if one is very familiar, it's always um, there's nothing new I can say, but it's still I think good for all of us to uh, think about this incredible subject and also to feel very fortunate that we've come in contact with um, such a one, uh, an amazing mind training practice. So um, yeah, I hope 
I can say something intelligent during this time. So right now, so now we're going to start with uh, some introductory prayers. So yeah, I think you've got the text. We're going to do the um, mandala offering for everything to be most auspicious as a sign of respect for the teacher and the, the teachings. And then we'll continue on with the refuge prayer. So continue with the refuge prayer. Right. So um, before we actually say the prayer itself, it's really important to sort of check our motivation for for being here. Um, so the, the, this teaching is part of the Mahayana tradition. So we should have a motivation that um, matches that that the purpose of the teaching. So right now it's good to check our motivation and correct it and, and as much as possible and to make it as strong and sincere uh, as possible and to make it as best as possible. And of course, the best motivation is the bodhicitta motivation. And although there are many causes of generating bodhicitta, many aspects to it, the essential thing is um, recognizing our connection with all sentient beings, how we depend completely on all sentient beings uh, for our daily existence, for you know, everything about our, our, our life, ordinary and spiritual. And we, receive, we have received every kind of kindness countless times from all sentient beings, especially the um, unconditional love of the mother. We've received this from every sentient being countless times in beginning with samsara. So um, we have this enormous debt, in a sense, to all sentient beings. And this debt is increasing all the time because every, every day that goes by, um, we, we are relying on the kindness, support, protection, help, encouragement of sentient beings. So the more we think about that, the more we can generate that, the mind wanting to repay their kindness, and the more we realize that sentient beings are, are trapped in cyclic existence, completely helpless, unknowingly creating the causes of more cyclic existence, then the mind wanting to repay sentient beings by helping them to be free of all causes of suffering, wanting them to be, to be completely free of cyclic existence, and more than that, to... Um, to be able to experience the peerless everlasting happiness of an enlightenment can arise. So, please, um, so imagining all sentient beings surrounding you right now, starting with your parents on either side, family, friends, and helpers behind you, harmers in front, and then as much as possible, all other sentient beings being aware that they are basically only kind, but only suffering, try and strongly generate that uh, bodhicitta motivation. 
at the same time, having that mind of refuge in the triple gem, visualizing Shakyamuni Buddha in front of oneself as the embodiment of uh, the, the three jewels of refuge and oneness with one's guru. So to achieve enlightenment, we have to generate bodhicitta and put it into practice. And um, we have to train our mind in developing bodhicitta and being able to overcome all the obstacles to um, perfecting our, and, uh, our that, that bodhicitta mind, all the obstacles to the path to enlightenment. So this is why um, we need to study this, this text, the eight verses of mind training. So think for the sake of all mother sentient beings, I will put effort into thinking about the, the eight verses of mind training with the, the motivation to as much as possible put these teachings into practice in my daily life. Sangge che dan zoge chonan la janju bardo dan e kyabzu chi dage che je gibe sanangi drola penje sangge drupar shog sangge che dan zoge chonan la janju bardo dan e kyabzu chi Targe jerje gibe sanangi, jola panjir sangge drupa shog. Sangge chedan zoge chonam la, chanjo bardo dane kyamsuchi. Targe jerje gibe sanangi, jola panjir sangge drupa shog. Okay, right. <clears throat> so maybe, uh, so we're visualizing the Buddha in front of us. So now we can imagine the Buddha now coming to the crown of our head, then dissolving into light, and then that light pouring down into us, blessing our mind to be able to understand the teachings on the eight verses of mind training, blessing our mind to be able to put these teachings into practice correctly, and blessing our mind to be able to eventually gain the complete realization of, of everything that is in, um, contained in that teaching of the eight verses. So then we can enhance this positive state of mind just by doing some simple breathing meditation, such as the, the, the nine round breathing exercise, just to, for a very short time, just to allow the mind to become a little bit more calm, more clear, more concentrated, so that uh, we can use that more subtle level of mind to listen to and think about the Buddha's teachings today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And just before I start, Paloma, uh, can I, am I supposed to be able to hear you? I can't hear anything. It, it feels kind of strange. It's 
Hi, uh, hi Neil. Uh, yeah. You cannot listen to me because I am on the Spanish channel. That means right. okay. that. Uh, but anyway, if okay. I have to uh, communicate with you, I just change to the English yeah. channel and, yeah. and or I can answer okay. you whatever you want. Okay, yeah. thank you, dear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, everyone. I'm, I'm, this is a little bit confusing for me. It's it's so strange sitting in my bedroom, talking to my computer and looking at these faces, and trying to imagine your your real wonderful selves actually in front of me. Anyway, right. So um, <clears throat> so uh, what is mind training? So, of course, all, all of the Buddhist teachings can be said to be mind training, but, in, but more particularly, my, uh, the term mind training or Lo Chong in Tibetan is about training the mind, particularly in generating bodhicitta. And as, as you all know, there are two main ways of generating bodhicitta, which is the method coming from uh, a Sangha, the, the six causes and one effect method and then there is the method coming from Shant the great bodhisattva shantideva of um, equalizing and exchanging self with others so um, mind training in relation to training the mind in bodhicitta is particularly associated with shantideva's method of uh, generating bodhicitta of equalizing and exchanging self with others um, And, and at, you know, developing bodhicitta, the wish to achieve enlightenment uh, in order to enlighten all sentient beings, you know, sounds something really unbelievable, incredible, and can be somewhat off-putting because it's such a huge thing. But in essence, what bodhicitta, you know, uh, as something that we can try to put into practice in our daily life, in essence, what it comes down to is overcoming the self-cherishing thought and, and cherishing others and trying to at least cherish others, but especially, of course, cherishing others more than self. So although these things are difficult, giving up the self-cherishing thought and cherishing others are difficult, these are things that we we can do, and this is really the the essence of um, of mind training and, and generating bodhicitta. Because the greatest obstacle to um, being able to generate bodhicitta and and increase it is uh, the, the self cherishing thought. Um, yeah. So. So also, um, so mind training is about uh, developing bodhicitta, especially through Shantideva's method of equalizing, exchanging self with equalizing and exchanging self with others. And at the heart of that is giving up the self cherishing thought and cherishing others more than self. But it's also important to understand that for our practice of bodhicitta to work, of course, it really depends on firstly training the mind in uh, re renouncing cyclic existence. One can't really generate bodhicitta. Uh, one can, you know, um, one can put imprints of bodhicitta in the mind without having renunciation. But until the, the great renunciation is um, is developed, we can't really completely develop bodhicitta. And we, and we can't renounce cyclic existence until we've renounced this life. You know, giving up our, which means giving up our obsession with the meaningless and, and negative things of this life. Right? So it's really important to see the whole of the Lam Rim, which is about developing, firstly, renouncing this life which is the practice of the, you know, the initial, of initial scope. Then there's the intermediate scope of renouncing samsara, 
that's the intermediate scope, and then the higher scope is, is generating bodhicitta. But it's all about bodhi developing bodhicitta. Renouncing this life is the first step in being able to actually generate bodhicitta. And once we've been able to really let go of our obsession with this life, then we can finally renounce cyclic existence. And then we, we are really able to have, we have the conditions to be able to generate, actually generate bodhicitta when we train in the causes of it. So um, anyway, what I'm trying to do at the moment is this is some sort of background to the eight verses, because um, uh, especially I think to, to really appreciate what the eight verses are all about, we have to really appreciate um, what self-cherishing is and, and the importance of cherishing others. So, um, of course, the basis of of um, bodhicitta is compassion. It, bodhicitta is more than compassion, but the, it's the basis of it, the essence of it, is great compassion. Just like you know, if you make a cake, you know that that, that cake has different ingredients, but the cake is something more than the sum of all the ingredients. So bodhicitta is more than the sum of all its causes, but the essential taste of bodhicitta is great compassion, just like the essential taste of a cake is it's sweet. Yeah, that's the, the you know, even you've got all these different ingredients, but the essential taste of the cake is something sweet. So bodhicitta has many causes, but the essential flavor of it is uh, great compassion and the great the basis of great compassion is developing loving kindness yeah of course you know these two things always go together but they are different of course you know compassion is the mind that cannot bear suffering of others and love is is wanting them happiness Actually, in the teachings, it makes the point that there, there are two, in a sense, kinds of love. And uh, the basic, you know, there, there is the, the love which is wanting others to be happy. And that happiness is not worldly happiness, but is, the, you know, is genuine, lasting happiness, right? That's what love is that mind that wants. Other, you know, sent, you know, oneself, of course, as well, but, but all sentient beings to experience genuine, lasting peace, contentment, well being, and so on. And, um, and the cause of that, really, when you think about it, the cause of developing that, that mind, wanting beings to have happiness genuine happiness is to come to the realization that although you know, oneself or and one's family friends strangers enemies may have all sorts of worldly accomplishments and success they may be good looking and healthy and wealthy and successful but that isn't doesn't represent it doesn't involve real happiness yeah the by the mere fact that we are sentient beings trapped in samsara being controlled by delusion and karma means we are bereft of ha real happiness we are completely lacking in real happiness and we're not in most of the time most sentient beings are not creating the causes to experience genuine happiness. It's only when we really get that, when we realize it, when it really kind of <laughs> sticks in our heart, that we, one can want people to be happy. 
if you think people are happy, you, you know, there's no point wanting to them to be happy if you think they're already happy. Like if someone is a billionaire, you know, uh, you don't go around thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice if this billionaire was rich? They're already rich. <laughs> yeah. So if you think someone is happy, and which is, which is we constantly make the mistake, we think we see other people and think they're happy, but they're in, in the cyclic existence, controlled by delusion and karma. So they are bereft of real happiness. We can intellectually understand that, but it's only when we start to, re, you know, when, it, when it really sinks in, can we develop that mind, love, wanting them to be genuinely happy all the time, perfectly happy. And the basis of that also, before we, we can develop that, that level of love, there is what is called uh, in, in Tibetan something like Yuongki Jampa, <laughs> which is, which translates, well, I think is called affectionate love. This is the basic kind of love from which the love wanting happiness arises and from which com compassion develops and from that great compassion and from that bodhicitta. And affectionate love is the love that arises when we, um, when we recognize the kindness of others. Yeah. So if someone is kind to us, then there is that feeling within our heart wanting, you know, wanting to be kind back. If someone, and, and that can you know, extend from a very kind of small kindness if someone smiles at a stranger, smiles at us, we are more likely to smile back at them. And, in, and for a short moment, we have this warm feeling towards that person. It may not last, unfortunately, very long, but it is there. That's a, you know, a tiny example, a simple example of this affectionate love that recognizes the kindness of someone. And so affectionate love is when we recognize the kindness of all sentient beings. And that, you know, that comes from thinking about how we depend on them so much in every conceivable way. From every, you know, from the moment we wake up to we go to bed, everything we use and depend on comes from the kindness of sentient beings. Yeah. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, everything, our education, our entertainment, our, our, our health, everything depends on the kindness of others. Yeah. And, and also uh, in following the spiritual path, we can only do it depending on the kindness of others. The kindness of, you know, there's the kindness that we receive directly from some but indirectly from others. And there's the kindness we receive in this life that depends on the kindness going back and back and back. So, um, yeah. So, the, yeah. So these are the things we have to train our mind in. Yeah, so important to reflect on the kindness of mother sentient beings and, and all the countless ways they are kind, that we, we have this huge debt to them, but that we shouldn't see that debt as a burden, but as something that you know, we are really, now that we've met the Dharma and we've, you know, we have a precious human rebirth, we have the optimum chance to repay that debt, yeah. And that, like, as I said at the beginning of the talk, that debt is constantly expanding day by day because we depend on the kindness of sentient beings day by day. But by practicing the Dharma, then we can begin to 
repay that, kind, that debt, to reduce that debt, eventually eliminate it by helping mother sentient beings to become, to achieve peerless, everlasting happiness. But am I talking too quickly, Paloma? It's good, okay, um, right. So, um, so uh, what the, the, the greatest obstacle to all of that, to recognizing the kindness of sons and beings and therefore developing affectionate love for them, uh, wanting to repay that kindness, uh, developing you know, the love that wants others to be happy and the great compassion, et cetera, et cetera. What prevents us doing that is good old or bad old, <laughs> and it's very, very old actually, and it's very, very bad, and it's called in English uh, self cherishing. Yeah. Um, so, self cherishing that, um, is, is such an incredibly important thing to understand. It's one of the key things in Mahayana Buddhism, I think, to understand. Um, so there are, I, from my understanding, from what I've understood from Lama Zoka Rinpoche, my, my main teacher, one could say that there are two levels of self-cherishing. There is really the gross self-cherishing, what, what I call, uh, I, I haven't seen this term used <laughs> from great authorities, but this is how I understand it. There is gr the gross self-cherishing thought, which is a completely negative state of mind that does, basically doesn't allow us to practice the Dharma, or if it does, then, um, then it, um, it, you know, when we do practice, you know, we, we practice very, very poorly and with wrong motivation and so on. Um, and, and then there is a subtle kind, and, and, and that self-cherishing um, is based on a, a wrong view of the self, Right, we have we have ignorance that self that creates the the illusion of an inherently existing self, a truly existing self, and then because of that we have this gross self cherishing that uh, tries to maintain the sense of that I, that self and make that I happy keep it happy, protect it from suffering. And, and so the, the English term, we've been talking, I've been talking with Paloma about this because the English terms cherishing, when you say self-cherishing, it sounds something really good, something we should really do. But um, our, our, our Western languages are translating the, a term in Tibetan, which is describing uh, an extremely harmful negative state of mind, because that cherishing we do is this like the self obsession we have. We think we are taking care of, of ourself, but the way we take care of ourselves with when we follow the self cherishing thought is we listen to our attachment our afflicted desire because that that you know and we're convinced that this is the way by following afflicted desire and attachment we will be happy and 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 uh, we also follow the negative mind of anger believing that anger will you know um that will protect us. That that will you know drive away uh, harmful inf people, influences, and so on. So because you know because we have this self cherishing thought, it activates all our disturbing thoughts. It activates our afflicted desire attachment. It activates our anger, and because of that, then we once attachment and anger are activated then we have all the other disturbing thoughts, pride and jealousies and fears and worries and all, you know, everything. 
a whole thing. So um, as I was giving this example of a cake uh, where you have a whole lot of ingredients and, and then the cake, which is made up of the, all those ingredients, but it's somehow something more than and different than the individual ingredients in the same way, what self-cherishing is in a sense, it's really how all our disturbing thoughts work together. You know, it's this interconnecting web of all our disturbing thoughts, right? And on that, you can label all of that working together as the gross self-cherishing. But the trouble is that self-cherishing thought. So, and so the essence of that self-cherishing thought is really attachment. It's attachment to me, my possessions, my family, my this, my that. And, and it's attached to um, the nearest moment. It, it leads us to be obsessed with being happy right now. Yeah. It doesn't think about the future. Um, Self-cherishing, as you've probably heard me say many times before, some of you, um, the self, the gross self-cherishing thought is this easy, happy now mentality that although we have the potential within, within us to experience everlasting, undeclining, perfect happiness, we never create the causes to experience it because our self-cherishing thought tells us, you know, because to create the causes for real happiness, to practice the Dharma, as we all know, it's hard. <laughs> dharma practice is difficult and it takes a long time. But the self-cherishing thought is addicted to wanting to be happy right now and anything that brings us happiness or gives the gives us the illusion the appearance of of happiness right now we label that good we label that happiness and if we can get it quickly and easily like right now then that is right that is good that is happiness and that's what the self-cherishing thought, the gross self-cherishing thought always encourages us to do. And we've been following that since beginningless time, during beginningless time. We've always, we tend to believe the lies of the illusion of the self-cherish, the, the false appearances that the self-cherishing thought creates. Yeah. So it's a disaster. And, and if you think about it, this happiness, somehow deep down, all of us, I think, are aware that we are unhappy. We are not you know, experiencing what we could be experiencing. And many people will deny this. You know, I've given talks in the past trying to talk about, you know, the four noble truths, the truth of suffering, and people walk out <laughs> saying, I'm perfectly happy. I'm not suffering. There's no suffering. Yeah. But somehow, deep, deep down, there is always, you know, this, um, this sense there. And when that sense of something you know, of disquiet and discomfort and something is starts to get stronger, we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to acknowledge it. And so that's when the self-cherishing thought, its solution to that, that uncomfortable feeling within us is to distract the mind from it. And if we can distract the mind from it, that is good. And that is what we call happiness. Yeah. 
and we've conditioned ourselves uh, over lifetimes to think like that and to behave like that. So we never give ourselves a chance to face difficulties and cut through things. And that's why we, we remain limited and suffering. And, and we follow the self-cherishing thought, believing that is good. Yeah, it seems to be telling us something that's quick and easy and, and it brings some kind of instant satisfaction, but we never think about the future consequences of our actions. It, we just, it's kind of with self, self cherishing can involve this sort of like tunnel vision where we focus on something and only think about the nearest moment and what what we can get right now. And that's why we can engage in so many negative actions and believing it's okay because it brings some instant result, some instant solution to the problem or some instant gratification. But we don't think, while we're under the control of the self-cherishing thought, and the stronger that self-cherishing thought is, it, it doesn't enable us to think about the consequences to others or the consequences to ourselves in the future. So it's a complete disaster. It, it's, we, we have the wrong view of self and we try to take care of this self or cherish the self, not, not in good ways, but in ways that are actually harmful to us by following afflicted desire, by following attachment, by following anger and jealousy and pride, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the eight verses later on mentions the eight, the eight worldly concerns. So following the eight worldly concerns, this is an example of when we're following any of the eight worldly concerns, it's an example of following the gross self-cherishing thought. And if you think about it, um, all of the 10 non-virtues, um, which um, if we engage in um, all of each and every one of the 10 non-virtues can become the cause of a lower realm, but being taking rebirth in a lower realm. None engaging in those causes of the, the 10 non-virtues, none of them can ever become a cause of a good rebirth. They can only eventually bring a bad rebirth, right? And if you, if, if you look into it, all of the 10 non-virtues of you know, killing, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, harsh speech and, and divisive speech and so on, and covetousness and ill will, wrong views, all of them, what motivates them is the self-cherishing thought. Yeah, We kill out of self-cherishing. You know, if the self-cherishing, if, if, our, if our life is threatened, you know, and our self-cherishing is strong, we, we become willing in, in that moment when the self-cherishing thought is operating, we are willing and capable of killing another human being, even people who are close to us. You know, this happens all the time, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, but we steal from people, lie. It's, you know, it's all examples of the self-cherishing thought. Whereas when, we, when, when there's the opportunity to um, kill something like an insect, but we don't do it 
So we're engaging in a virtuous action, which is, you know, uh, uh, can be a cause for a good rebirth and also, also other beneficial things. In that moment that we make the decision not to harm, not to kill another living being, in that moment, the self-cherishing thought isn't there. And what is there, even it may be not very strong and it may not last very long, that we have the, the thought cherishing others, cherishing another, at least one other being. It may be a tiny sentient being, but in that moment, we are concerned about their well being. And because of that, we don't harm them consciously, we don't harm them. And that uh, is generating a positive karmic imprint that is going to bring great benefit in the future. <clears throat> Just another point to think about with the gross self cherishing thought is that. I mean, in, in essence, um, you could say the self-cherishing thought is, um, and selfishness is the same thing, but there is a little bit of a, you know, you know all, all selfishness is self-cherishing, but not all self-cherishing is selfishness because selfishness is really where you you only think about yourself and completely ignore others and, and, and have become willing to harm them. And, that, and, and so, so that fits with self-cherishing. But with self-cherishing, some aspects of self-cherishing, it's not about being selfish in relation to other people. It's the self-cherishing thought can just simply be harm, you know, without harming others, it's harming oneself because we always take the easy way out. When there's something that we could be doing that is really beneficial for ourselves, but it's difficult to do, it may take a long time to do, then the self cherishing thought makes all sorts of excuses. So we don't do it, so we don't get the benefit. So, I mean, the obvious example for us as so-called Buddhist practitioners is, you know, there are so many Dharma practices we could do. You know? uh, so many things we could be doing and, and in various situations. Sometimes we do them and sometimes we don't. And why don't we do them sometimes is because the self-cherishing thought has got in the way, it won't allow us to do it. it. It tells us some worldly thing, one of the eight worldly concerns is much, you know, much more important, much more beneficial, much more rewarding. Um, as you all know, as it says in the teachings, you know, uh, if you if if you look at the difference between sentient beings and Buddhas, you know uh, the Buddhas are, are those who have given up the self cherishing thought and cherish others more than self, whereas we sentient beings we're still stuck with cherishing ourselves. What more is there to say? Yeah. So uh, this is something that. So this is, we, we, it, in order to practice, to understand the eight verses of mind training and to want to put them into practice, the whole basis is uh, understanding what the self-cherishing thought is and understanding how incredibly harmful it is. There is no developing the understanding that there is not the slightest benefit in ever following the self-cherishing thought. Yeah. And, and therefore, by developing that understanding and relating it to oneself, being able to, uh, it's one thing to sort of understand in an abstract way what self-cherishing thought is and how harmful it is. 
that what we have to do is recognize our own self-cherishing thought. Yeah. You know, it's very easy for us to see the faults in other people, but we don't recognize, it's so much harder to recognize and admit our own faults. But this is what, what is so vital is to be able to recognize in the moment when the self-cherishing thought arises, such as you when you're in Spain and it's cold in the morning and you have to get up and you don't want to get up, that, that, that lovely little thought in your mind that tells you don't get up, it's too cold, just stay in bed one minute longer, that is the self-cherishing thought. And it's just a small example, but that's the one that we have to stop. And as it, you know, as it says in the teachings, the way to practice Dharma is you start with the little things, the small things, the easy things to do and build up. But if we keep you know, giving in to the, these little self-cherishings, we'll never be able to give up the great ones. Yeah. But we have, that's, we have to recognize that this is the self-cherishing thought. Because, you know, as it also says in the teachings, somewhere where, you know, the enemy never appears with horns on their head, you know, the, <laughs> that you, um, they, they often appear as friends. The enemy appear, can appear as a friend. They're not necessarily easy to recognize. And so the self-cherishing thought doesn't announce itself as the self-cherishing thought. It announces, it appears as, you know, the good idea, the best friend idea. Yeah. So it's yeah, really putting the eight verses into practice is about um, understanding you know, what the self cherishing thought is, being able to recognize in oneself and really feeling how harmful it is that it's such an obstacle uh, to our ordinary life, let alone our spiritual life, and, and, and therefore wanting to overcome it, you know, to overcome it, not to follow it, to give it up. And more than that, to begin to cherish others and cherish others more than self eventually. Yeah. And to recognize that um, right now we have the precious human rebirth, which means we've got the optimum chance to do this. We've been following the self cherishing thought all of this life, not all the time, of course, <laughs> fortunately, but with all of this life, we've been come, we, we come under the control of it again and again, but we've been following it in all our previous lives. This is, because, this is why we're not a Buddha, why we're not enlightened, why we're still in cyclic existence. But in this life, we've had the good fortune to have met the Dharma and even more fortunate that we've met the Mahayana Dharma that explains the, all of this. The self To understand the self-cherishing thought is so helpful, incredible. And then on, on that understanding, we need to you know, work on it, do something about it. And the, the, the eight verses of mind training helps us to do that. Um, just quickly, I will get on to the eight verses at some point. <laughs> uh, um, is that, um, so what I've been talking about now so far is uh, really the, the gross self-cherishing thought, um, you know, which is, is really obsessed with this life, you know, just the pleasures and problems of this life. It doesn't really give us a chance to think about future lives. But then there is another more subtle type of self-cherishing, which is not 
really a negative state of mind. It's actually a virtuous, it is a virtuous state of mind, but from a Mahayana point of view, it is a state of mind that we need to give up, to reject, to let go of and not follow because the subtle self-cherishing is, is, is the mind that um, is practicing the Dharma. It may have even started to, to develop some correct understanding or experience of, of the I as not truly inherently existent. Uh, and it is practicing the Dharma, so it's not, uh, it's giving up, you know, um, an opposing attachment and anger, et cetera, et cetera. But why, from a Mahayana point of view, this subtle self cherishing is, one could say, a negative state of mind is that, um, or it's uh, something to be abandoned, is because. Um, this subtle self-cherishing is, is concerned just about me becoming free of suffering, me getting out of cyclic existence and getting out of cyclic existence as quickly as possible. So it doesn't focus on uh, others so much. Of course, to become free of cyclic existence and become an arhat, one has to develop you know, love and compassion and patience, et cetera, et cetera. But one doesn't develop the mind that really cherishes others and, and cherishes others more than self and wants to help all of them to become free of cyclic existence as well. Yeah. So while we have that subtle self-cherishing thought, we won't be able to generate bodhicitta. So it is a virtuous mind, but it is, it is an obstacle to bodhicitta, an obstacle to achieving enlightenment. So with working on, on the, our, our gross self-cherishing, we at the same time, we need to try and replace that with the mind cherishing others more than self. For, the, for these things to try to go together, to reduce the, the, self, the, 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 the gross self-cherishing, but wanting to reduce that in order to be able to cherish others more than self because of starting to recognize how incredibly kind sentient beings are, developing that affectionate love for them, that can grow into that love, wanting them to be free of suffering, which enables our potential for compassion and great compassion to develop more and more, which can enable us to generate bodhicitta and achieve enlightenment. Right. Um, is, there, is, are there any questions so far? Anything? Anyone have a question? Wait a minute, and uh, uh, somebody is going to tell me something, maybe. Hay preguntas, Paloma. Eh, no, there is no questions, looks like. Oh, eh, okay. <laughs> everything is very clear. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Uh, okay, moving on a little bit. Um, right. Um, Sorry if I'm, I'm boring you with saying the you know everything you know that you've heard a million times before. But anyway, I just I I, I feel the need to emphasise this part uh, about understanding self cherishing and giving it up. And uh, and also, what can um, help to um, motivate us to give up the self cherishing thought? And, and, and recognize it's har uh, 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 how harmful it is, is also to understand the benefits of cherishing others and, and cherishing others more than self. So, you know, um, you know it, it seems counterintuitive because when we're under the control of the self-cherishing thought, 
uh, our, the, the logic it seems to be that if, if I, in order for me to be happy, in order for me to avoid suffering, I have to spend so much time on myself. Yeah, if I don't do that, then I, you know, how will I become happy? And I'm, I will open myself up to, uh, you know, harm in so many ways. But, but the reality is by focusing so much on oneself all the time, we, it, it just, it, it acts as the condition for all our disturbing thoughts to activate and, and to harm us. And on the other hand, un, under the control of the self-cherishing thought, we think if I put my energy onto being concerned about others, then there will be, there'll be no time for me, you know, and I will suffer. But the point is, this is what we should, you know, understand more and more first logically to motivate us to do it more and more is that in cherishing others although the object you know is is we, we we're taking the um attention away from ourself onto others but how we are and, and so the, our attention is on others and how is it on others it's by focusing our thoughts of affectionate love or the love wanting them to be happy or on compassion and patience and perseverance, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, to cherish others, we it, it, it activates our virtuous minds, our positive minds. The only way we can cherish others from a Dharma point of view, not from a worldly point of view, but by practicing the Dharma way of cherishing others, the only way that can be done is through cultivating our virtuous minds. And the moment we are cultivating our virtuous minds, although the object is to benefit others, those virtuous states of mind, which we are directing towards others, are benefiting ourselves. Yeah. Right. There is a question. There is a question. Um, Maggie, you can speak in English. You can speak in English your question to, to you can add your mic. Okay, vale, perfecto. Vale. Okay. Do I ask the question in English? Oh. Yes, 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 you, you asked in English. I, I got a bit lost when you said all self-cherishing is not selfish, but all selfishness is self-cherishing? Yes. I got lost. I don't quite get that. I'm sorry. <laughs> all self-cherishing is not selfish. Yes, because... Uh, it's not necessarily when something that's been when you're when we're being selfish, it is it is uh, there's no it's in relation to others and it leads to our selfish behavior leads to harm to others, right? Would you agree? Yeah, 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 right. Whereas, so all of that, our example, all all selfishness. Is exa are examples of self-cherishing. But there is one aspect of self-cherishing which has nothing to do with harming other, that behavior, that self-cherishing behavior doesn't harm others, but it does harm ourselves. So it's not selfish, but it's self-cherishing, it's harmful. And I gave, you know, like I always do, the same simple example of um, you know, there's something that we could do that is really beneficial for ourselves. It could be a worldly benefit or it could be a Dharma benefit, but we don't do it because, you know, oh, you know, the self-cherishing thought tells us 
it's too hard, it's too difficult, I can't do this, blah, blah, blah. So that's an example of self-cherishing, which is not selfish, but it's harmful. Okay, so it's harming ourselves. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My grandmother used to say, me, myself, and I. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the idea, right? When you're with this self-cherishing and the selfishness, she would yeah. say, you're just thinking of me, myself, and I. Yes, yes. Is that it? Uh, well, yes, but also. <laughs> she yeah. was a Buddhist. Yeah, okay, let's leave it at that. It gets too tricky otherwise. Yes, that's okay. Yeah, that's just good. Okay. Right, let's we go back. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, the more we see the benefits of cherishing others, that it uh, it is it it can't harm us. It is actually, um, especially from a dharma point of view, it it, it is awakening our positive potentials. And it, while we're cherishing others, we are in a good state. So there should be some kind of happiness, right? Because uh, peace, contentment, well-being in our mind while we're cherishing others. But on top of that, we are generating positive imprints in our mind that will benefit us in the future, but also enable us to be able to be to be able to cherish others more, uh, even more in the future. Whereas when we follow the self-cherishing thought, actually it's activating our disturbing thoughts. So in the moment, those are active. We are not so happy and content, and we're creating the causes of more suffering now and in the future and creating more obstacles to following the Dharma. Yeah. So if we think about this more and more, which is what we're supposed to be doing, which is what we're encouraged to do, then it, this can motivate us to really see that the self-cherishing thought is our greatest enemy. Yeah. But both aspects of it, but especially the, the gross self-cherishing thought, because until we get rid of that, you know, we won't, uh, we won't be able to experience the subtle self-cherishing. Uh, firstly, we have to deal with the gross self-cherishing thought. Right. Okay. Um, so this leads into the eight verses of mind training or thought transformation, which is transforming the mind away from self-cherishing to being able to cherish others and especially cherishing other, others more than self. So um, the first thing I should say that um, uh, I, 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 I try not to give any so-called teachings. I, I don't know what, what I, my mumblings are called teachings or not, but uh, I only try to teach subjects that I've received teachings from, from you know, proper teachers that I've received the lineage from. So I, I received the, the teaching on the eight verses of mind training from Lama Soka Rinpoche, Kyabushe Dupton Soka Rinpoche, at Chen Rezig Institute around, I think it was in 1979. Um, and also I've received the, 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 this, the, the, the eight verses teaching from His Holiness the Dalai Lama in, in Dharamsala uh, and the Lung also from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So uh, at that teaching, His Holiness uh, uh, encouraged people to, um, to, to memorize these, these eight verses because they are really quite short and they're so incredibly helpful and practical. So I would encourage people if they can to, if they're serious about this subject, to, um, to, to, to try and, and memorize these. Um, yeah. So um, the, these verses were 
composed, as you know, by um, um, Langri Tungpa. Uh, his ordination name was Dorji Senge. So it, it's interesting that these verses were written that, you know, many of the texts we study or most of the texts we study were written by great practitioners and scholars um, as advice for others. Whereas the eight verses were written down by Langri Tangpa as advice to himself. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a, a special power in that because he, you know, he was a great practitioner himself and he wrote these, these lines down to remind himself that he was giving himself teachings of what to do. So, um, but then they became known and then a whole tradition of uh, teaching them and commenting on them developed. Um, also, uh, it's interesting to know that uh, as, as uh, in the example, there are many, uh, ver well, not many, there are, there are some in Tibetan, some slightly different versions of the eight verses of transformation. But also, for example, in, in English, there are quite many different translations and each of them, you know, sometimes it was some verses give a slightly different flavor to the point. Um, but this particular version that was translated by uh, Lama Zoka Rinpoche or under his, under his um, guidance uh, follows the, the very original way that they were composed by uh, Langri Tangpa because it said, for example, um, in the first verse, it says, um, determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel, I shall hold them most dear at all times. So he's say, talking to himself, I will do this. So each verse is like that, where he's saying, I will do this, right? I'm definitely going to do this. Whereas uh, about um, a few generations after this text started to circum 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 circulate in Tibet, um, one Geshe, Geshe called Geshe Sang Chengpa, changed the wording. So instead of saying, I will do this, he, 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 he says, may I, yeah? So it became um, like, it, it got turned into like a, more like a requesting prayer where you're requesting the blessings of the gurus and the Buddhas to be, you know, for you, for us to be able to do this. Whereas Langri Tangpa is saying, you know, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> uh, whereas, um, I think my, my interpretation, this is just my personal uh, idea, is that why this Geshe Sang Chengpa changed it is because um, if, if we're honest, most of us can't do the, the practice these eight verses properly. They, you know, these are the practices of a bodhisattva, of, of an advanced, you know, to do this properly, one, you know, one has to be a really advanced hardcore Dharma practitioner. So in some ways, um, for us at our level, it's probably better to think you know, rather than say, I will do this, to, you know, to, 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 especially when, when we meditate on these, to say, may I, you know, to make this request to the Guru Buddhas that may I be able to do this. Can I, may I be able to do it as much as I'm able at the moment to do this? Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, something to think about. Um, so um, I, I'm not going to go into the history of the verses other than just very quickly to say that um, uh, the, these eight verses of thought transformation um, became known, but they were among a very select group of people, but they were kept secret. They weren't taught publicly because in those wonderful good old days, 
uh, teachings uh, or, or many teachings weren't made public because uh, they were they were restricted to people that the the, the lama thought uh, only this this student will be able to really practice it so they only gave it gave the teaching to to students that they were familiar with who they were sure this student will go off and practice this properly so it was kept secret but after some time um due to due to Jesh, uh, geshe chikawa these um the eight verses were made he started to teach them publicly and the story goes and um, i read this recently and i can't now find where i read it because I, I i dug up a whole lot of books about the eight but commentaries on the eight verses and now i can't find where i read it but trust me this is true that um apparently um i think it was geshe chikawa um he found these verses incredibly beneficial himself and he was thinking well you know but they haven't been taught publicly and he knew why but he started he had some connection with a, a, um, a lot of lepers you know who was suffering from leprosy and he started teaching these eight verses to these lepers who who themselves found it helpful for their incredibly suffering situation and he thought well if it can benefit them then this th these teachings should be taught more widely to other people you know dharma practitioners so the eight verses actually became known around that time as the as the, as the the, the leper teaching <laughs> so we are the modern day lepers yeah we desperately need this teaching sorry to <laughs> if i've offended you by saying that <laughs> oh dear oh dear right okay so uh, the um as i as i was saying you know understanding the eight verses um, is, is to do to do that properly one really has to understand it's all about overcoming the self-cherishing thought and recognizing how harmful it is and wanting to ch be able to really cherish others more than self understanding how beneficial it is for oneself and of course for others to be able to cherish others yeah right so uh, it, when we read and re reflect on each of the verses i think it's really quite helpful to add at the beginning of each verse to you know to, to really put it in context and and to make it uh, more directly meaningful i mean it's all incredibly meaningful anyway but to, to make it really directly meaningful one can say at the beginning of each verse understanding how harmful my self-cherishing is then i am determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel and i shall hold them most dear at all times in other words understanding how bad my self cherishing harmful it is and wanting to cherish others more than self understanding how beneficial beneficial it is i am determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel and i shall hold them most dear at all times yeah. so in that first line uh, it says um originally uh, the the translations that were available in the in the fpmt of the the eight verses said determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit for all sentient beings so that makes a lot of sense that we you know um that fits with our our normal understanding of the bodhisattva practice that we want to be beneficial for all sentient beings but lama zobarimashi has changed that 
and has said, has, uh, and says, determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings. So some people have taken exception to that and say, oh, that sounds like cell cherishing. That sounds like we're, you know, uh, uh, you're, we're taking advantage of self sentient beings. We want to get something from them. That, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like Dharma practice. That doesn't sound like what a, a bodhisattva should do. But if one reflects on it, what its meaning in, in being determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings, how, how can one obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings? And the only way we can do that from a Dharma point of view, like from a nasty worldly point of view, we could steal from them and enslave them and, and do, you know, lie to them and all that. But that's, that, that actually isn't getting any real benefit for ourselves. It gives the illusion some worldly benefit that lasts a short time and then ends up with suffering in the lower realms. The only way we can get the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings is to benefit them, to be kind to them, to have you know ex at least experience affectionate love towards them, or the or even better, the love wanting them to have genuine happiness, to be compassionate with them, to be patient with them, to practice. Uh, morality in relation to them and so on all right so it makes great sense to use that word from determined to obtain the greatest benefit benefit from all sentient beings so um and but also another way one could understand that is that um by being by by being kind and cherishing others um that that is helping them uh in in the in the mo at that at that time but by being kind to sentient beings we accumulate merit right and that merit is needed to gain the realizations that will bring us uh freedom from samsara and enlightenment you know merit itself doesn't bring about enlightenment but in order to um you know to, in order to gain real the it's realizations of the path to enlightenment that free us from samsara and eventually uh, uh, bring us to enlightenment right there are all the different realizations what do we need to gain those realizations well, we need to listen to the teachings about the, those realizations. For example, we need the realization of impermanence. So we need to under, we need to listen to teachings from qualified teachers about impermanence, and we have to meditate on those teachings in order to get the realization. But to get the realization, we also need to purify our mind. And we need merit. Yeah, we need that merit. Yeah. And how do we get that merit? The only it is by, well, there's various ways of accumulating merit, but of course, um, so much merit is accumulated by practicing in relation to sentient beings. Neil is almost the time of break. Oh, it is. Uh, <laughs> no one said anything. Anyway, so I, I warned you. I warned you. Um, anyway, yeah, we'll stop here. Yeah. So half hour break, right? Okay. Half an hour, right? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, don't need to don't need to turn go off. out. Turn off. Just uh, yeah, turn no. off the camera. That's all.
turn 